third out of five, integrity. What do I mean by integrity? I mean something like staying true to yourself over time, right? Having a coherent life narrative in which we preserve the values and projects that have shaped our life, a sense of continuous identity over time. Now, some people, for various reasons, go through radical shifts in their life, uh, religious conversions or other kinds of powerful changes in course. So some of us don't feel like our life has that kind of integrity over time. It may be fragmented and so on. But for most of us, it's at least a defeasible goal that over time we be able to see our life and our identities as kind of whole or continuous, at least to some extent. I think of integrity as something like being at home in myself, right? Being able to sustain a coherent self. Let's think for just a moment about the kind of social scaffolding that's required to preserve and enable integrity. Right? For, for most of us, whether or not you can have a coherent sense of self and a coherent identity doesn't just have to do with internal choices that we make. It has to do with whether you can sustain coherent habits, relationships, and activities Right? And that has a lot to do with whether you're at home in your material and your social environment. Right? We need a certain amount of security and stability and dependability in the world around us. We need to know that the same people are going to be there and are going to be roughly the same as they were before. That the um, things that happen in our neighborhood are for the most part going to be fairly predictable. That if we go somewhere, we know what it's going to be like when we get there. There needs to be that basic ability to understand and be competent in and feel secure in our environment in order for us to be able to make choices that let us design a life that has relative coherence to it. Right? If you have no idea what to expect out of your environment, then you don't know how to interact with it in a way that will let you sustain a coherent self over time. Now, part of the reason I think that integrity is an especially important version of autonomy in the domain of healthcare, and notice, by the way, how little what I just said has to do with informed consent or the dominant model that we started with, right? It bears almost no relationship to that dominant model of autonomy. And yet, I think integrity is a particularly important dimension of autonomy in the domain of health and healthcare. And here's why. Illness and injury are way up there in terms of the things that can radically disrupt our sense of self and the shape of our life and the narrative of our life. They can produce a radical breach so if you're a healthcare professional and you're dealing with a patient and you're worried about respecting that patient's autonomy, one thing to worry about is are they informed about their options and are they making a manipulate an unmanipulated choice among them as to their treatment plan. But a completely different, at least as important thing to worry about is how is this illness or this medical crisis that they're going through interrupting or tearing apart their sense of who they are, their ability to understand the narrative that they're in the middle of, right? How has it if impacted that narrative? And it's not just about the physical illness or injury that their body is undergoing either. It's the fact that when you have an illness or an injury, where you end up is in the hospital. And hospitals are weird, right? <laughs> they're really deeply weird. When you go from not being in the hospital to being in the hospital, basically every single routine and project that you had, every single lived, felt understanding that you had about your environment and what made sense in it and what you were up to is suddenly gone at once, right? And all of a sudden, you're radically dependent on other people for, their, for your care and on other people's schedule for when you get that care, right? All of a sudden, your body works in a different way. You have different bodily capacities than you had before. Your body feels different than it had before. It's not predictable how your body is going to feel. It's not predictable when your meal is going to come. <laughs> it's not predictable who's going to be sleeping in the bed next to you all of a sudden or what sounds they're going to be making. 
and people are rushing in and out of your room and it's lit differently than you're used to and all of that stuff, both the sort of very abstract stuff about what's actually going on in your life and what is this going to mean for your career and your children and all of that and the completely unabstract totally concrete stuff about how you feel being in the space that you're in and the sounds and the smells and all of that are radically breached. Right? So sustaining integrity in the face of that or rebuilding integrity in the face of that can be unbelievably hard. And I think that one thing that health professionals need to be thinking about carefully when they're thinking about protecting autonomy is protecting integrity as best they can in a situation where it's very difficult to do so. One thing that I think gets not enough bioethical attention at all, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot this year in particular because of some experiences of mine and close friends, because I'm at that age where people's parents are dying. That's the generational moment that I'm at. Um, is that illness can be a radical breach in integrity, not just for the patient, but also for the people who are caring for that patient. And I wonder how many of you can draw on this from your own experience, because even those of you who are health professionals, I've talked to health professionals about this who feel very at home in the hospital environment because it's where they work. But if, if, they, if their role in that environment switches, it's a whole different game. So in other words, when you go from somebody who's just living your life and going to your job and going home to your kids, and then all of a sudden a loved one is in the hospital, and you switch into this completely different mode of living, where all of a sudden your day is structured by visiting hours, right? And all of a sudden you are coordinating a bunch of other family members. I'm assuming almost everybody in this room has had this stage at some point in their life, where all of a sudden your life becomes, I'm coordinating getting Aunt Thelma and Brother Jim and so on to the hospital, and all we're doing is going there and sitting in this weird room with people rushing in and out of it, watching our loved one be a completely different person and we're there for exactly two hours and then we're kicked out and we're mentally fried so we go to the hospital cafeteria and eat jello and go home and put our kids to bed and then do the same thing over again. It's, it can be a radical breach in integrity and in sense of self for the loved ones too and not just for the patient and I think that that's a crucial little piece of the healthcare puzzle and the bioethics puzzle that hasn't gotten enough, um, enough attention. So on the one hand, integrity and self-determination are very different, as I've pointed out, right? One is about having a whole and coherent sense of self, and one is about being able to make and stick to and pursue cho um, options. Not only are they different, but they can conflict, right? Self-determination and integrity can be in conflict with one another, and it can be very confusing from a bioethics point of view to know how to respond to that. So the most obvious example of this is when sud suddenly a patient changes her long-standing views about something really important, right? So think about um, what can happen during end-of-life care or fertility treatment, say, or in the middle of childbirth, where somebody, let's just take childbirth as an example. Somebody has, for nine months, been saying, oh, it's absolutely more important to me than anything to have a natural birth. I don't want pain medications. I want to try to do this without a cesarean. This is like absolutely central to my sense of self, who I am, my values. And then they're in the labor and delivery delivery room and they're screaming, give me drugs right now, cut it out, right? Um, protecting self-determination, narrowly construed, would seem to countenance giving them the drugs and cutting it out. Protecting integrity, narrowly construed, would seem to countenance saying, no, that's not what you actually want when you're, you know, when you're more yourself, I have your birth plan right here. <laughs> I think both the option of just blindly sticking to the birth plan and the option of just blindly giving the person what they're screaming for are probably overly simplistic and neither is really the autonomy protecting response, right? What we have here is a conflict between the two. In, in general, I'm in favor of giving the person the drugs when they're screaming for drugs. But, <laughs> but doing some work, you know, as best you can to sort of help that patient reconcile these two things, it's probably going to have to go fast in that case, but um, it seems to be, you know, sort of being fully aware that what we have here is just two different legitimate dimensions of autonomy, and we have to think through what the most 
um, respectful option is in the face of that strikes me as really hard and important. I'm sort of sorry I use the birth example now because it moves too fast, but end of life care is another great example where you have somebody whose desires all of a sudden at the very end of life might conflict with everything they've said for years about how they want things to go at the end of life, right? And then you've got to do some actual work with them about, is this really that you just have changed your mind, which is totally legitimate, and you understand things differently now than you did before? Or are you speaking from a place of not being at home, not being able to really be in control of what you value because you're so ripped out of your environment that you can't really manage anymore? Those are, you know, we need to work that through. So those can be in conflict with one another. <laughs> 